Друзья, добрый день. У меня просьба ко всем, с вашего позволения, чтобы люди, которые придут попозже, опоздавшие, не бегали через вас. Подвиньтесь, пожалуйста, все к центру, если вас не затруднит. Вот задний ряд меня интересует. Угу. Просто, пожалуйста, все вот максимально займите центральные места, чтобы люди приходили, быстренько садились и не мешали ни нам, ни докладчикам. Ко мне проходите со стульями сюда, вот туда. Спасибо большое. Сейчас начнем буквально минутку. Алло. Hello, my name is Алексей Байтин. I'm a head of machine translation department at <coughs> Yandex. And just a few words before uh, our guest uh, start the le his lecture. <coughs> uh, I think everybody agree that uh, natural language processing is a combination of mm, linguistics and uh, computer science and uh, the question how to mix them together how to join them such separate things and uh, how to make them work in efficient manner it's very uh, difficult question and uh, probably <coughs> um, the most notable expert in the area uh, professor that uh, Uppsala University, professor of computational linguistics, sorry, at Uppsala University, mm, vice president of uh, ACL, uh, Association for Computational Linguistics, and, uh, mm, uh, and other of famous Malt Parse, mm, organizer of uh, universal dependency, and so on, so on. Joachim Nivre. <coughs> Just a few words about, uh, uh, please ask your question after the lecture and uh, to start speaking, press right mm, button on the microphone, okay? So, uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Can you hear me, everyone? Okay, so, right. Uh, so, I'm very happy to be here um, to talk about... Um, um, universal dependencies, which were already mentioned, uh, under the somewhat uh, pretentious title of Towards a Universal Grammar for Natural Language Processing. Oops. Um, I just want to say before I start, and it's also uh, shown on the slide, that this is based on collaborative work with uh, a very large group of people and a growing group of people, some of which, a few of which are listed on this first slide, some of which are in the audience, uh, and many more of which will be listed in a longer list at the end. So, but um, first things first. The idea of a universal grammar uh, for all languages uh, can be traced uh, quite far back in human history. Uh, I think the earliest uh, that I found, at least, was Roger Bacon uh, in the 13th century, in the Middle Ages who, uh, when writing about the grammar of Greek and making some comparisons with uh, the grammar of Hebrew, uh, made the sort of observation or claim that in its substance, grammar is one and the same in all languages, even if it accidentally varies. Now, this is an idea that sort of was picked up and developed in the Middle Ages by the so-called speculative grammarians. 
and it's then been sort of rediscovered or reinvented uh, several times throughout history. So in uh, the 17th century, there was the famous Port Royal grammar in France, Arnaud et Lancelot, who had a similar idea claiming that sort of the grammar of uh, natural language was universal and the same for all languages. Uh, and of course, in the 20th century, it's been associated perhaps in particular with Chomsky, who have sort of developed a, a special version of this. This is a picture of a rather young Chomsky looking a bit like Sherlock Holmes here. Uh, <coughs> so, and all these different conceptions of a universal grammar uh, have some, um, th they're, th they have similarities and differences, but the, I mean, the basic idea in all of them is the idea that all human languages are species of a common genus. So there is a limit to the kind of variation that you can expect to find between different languages. And the other sort of main assumption is that this is the case because language structure is constrained by some universal cause. Now, what has differed in different versions of this is what this universal cause is, right? So for Bacon and the speculative grammar grammarians working in an Aristotelian framework, uh, the cause was basically the world itself. So language, the, the, the categories of language reflected the categories of the world in a fairly direct way, right? Uh, when we come to the Port Royal grammarians, uh, the external world has been replaced by the human mind. So the linguistic categories are determined by the human mind and the human mind is universal, therefore uh, the grammar categories must also be universal. Uh, and when we come to Noam Chomsky, this has been specialized even further into uh, a, a special innate uh, language faculty and so on. But uh, the basic idea is that there is order in the chaos of linguistic variation. Now, what has this got to do, you may ask, with the second uh, concept in the title, namely natural language processing? Well, uh, when we're working on natural language processing, um, linguistic diversity makes our life harder. Having to cope with many different languages with many different characteristics makes our job harder. But I would argue also much more interesting, right? So, uh, and for quite some time now, I have been intrigued by this question uh, that I've summed up here uh, in the following way. So why it is, is it the case that when we perform controlled experiments on automatic syntactic analysis or parsing for English under favorable conditions, basically parsing the Wall Street Journal, as many of you are familiar with, we can observe uh, an accuracy of, uh, let's say, 90% according to some standard evaluation metric. Um, should I use the, that mic instead? Okay. Uh, but when, we've, when we perform the same experiment under equally favorable conditions, but we're only changing the language, and okay, Finnish is just one example here. I could have chosen many other languages, uh, but I happen to be interested in Finnish. Uh, we only, we're happy if we can get 80% accuracy, right? So why is that the case? Well, as a linguist, I sort of refuse to believe that some languages are intrinsically harder to parse or understand than others. So to me, this suggests that there's something wrong with our computational models here. Now, uh, another thing that has become more and more clear to me over the years is that it's not even clear that we can actually compare these numbers because even though we try to uh, control all the difference, there is one thing that varies, and this has to do uh, with the notion of linguistic annotation. So current natural language processing relies very heavily on linguistic annotation, uh, especially if you're doing things like syntactic parsing. We use, uh, we use annotated resources to train our parsers, and we also use annotated resources to evaluate our parsers. And, but the problem is that pretty much every language comes with its own special annotation scheme. Uh, so annotation schemes vary across languages almost as much as the languages themselves. So it's very tempting to paraphrase, paraphrase Bacon here and say that in its substance, grammar is the same in all languages, even if the annotation accidentally varies, right? So I think it's time uh, that we 
uh, bring some order into this particular chaos. And that's uh, basically what the talk is about. So just to drive this point home even further, we're going to play a little game together here, uh, which is about uh, identifying unknown languages, or at least how they are related to each other. So here is a sentence is in an unknown language X, uh, which has been anonymized by omitting the word. So I'm just giving you a bare dependency structure here, not even any labels. Here is a close, uh, faithful translation of that sentence into another language, Y, which gives a different structure. And here is a third language, Z. And the question is, can we say anything about, just by looking at these structures, how these languages are related? For example, which languages are most closely related here? Well, there's clearly not a lot of information that we can use here, but one thing we can do is we can compare th uh, the dependencies in the language. So if we compare language X to language Y, we see that they in fact only share a single dependency, which is the very last one. So it seems, for example, that language Y seems to be predominantly head initial, so most of the arrows go from left to right, whereas language X is more mixed in this respect. It has both head initial and head final dependencies. Uh, if we do the same exercise with the other language, we find a little more in common. So it seems that maybe uh, a reasonable tentative conclusion here would be that uh, language Y is, the m is most different from the other. Uh, let's see, l no, sorry. Language X and language Y are most distant from each other, and language Z is somewhere in between. Now it turns out uh, that all of this is complete nonsense because the three languages are in fact Swedish, Danish, and English. And uh, Swedish and Danish, as you may know, are essentially dialects of the same language. And English, although a little bit different, is very closely related. And for this particular sentence, which is something like a cat chases rats and mice, and the corresponding translations into Danish and Swedish have exactly the same syntactic structure. There's no difference whatsoever. The only reason they look so different is that the Swedish sentence has been annotated according to the guidelines of the Swedish tree bank. The Danish sentence has been annotated according to the Copenhagen dependency tree bank. And the English sentence has been annotated according to Stanford dependencies. Right. So this is the chaos that we need to do something about. So first of all, why is this a problem? Well, for many different reasons. First of all, it makes it really hard to compare empirical results across languages. So when I say we get 90% for English, 80% of Finnish, who knows how much of that difference is due to differences between the language as opposed to just more or less arbitrary differences between the annotation schemes, right? Uh, it's even more difficult to evaluate cross-lingual learning. Cross-lingual learning is something that has become very popular in NLP in recent years. It's the basic idea that if you have a lot of resources for one language and um, much less resources for another language, which could be closely related to the first language, then you can actually use data from one language to train a model and transfer it to the other. Now, whenever we want to evaluate such a scheme, we have to rely on, on the small annotated resources that are available for these languages. But if these differ as much as the one I just showed you, again, we have no idea uh, of how many of the actual errors that we uh, um, observed for a parser are real parsing errors as opposed to just discrepancies between the annotation. From a more practical point of view, it makes it really hard and tedious to build and maintain multilingual systems. Suppose you want to do question answering in 10 languages, right? Then it would be very nice if you had, if the syntactic analysis looked the same for all the languages so that you could reuse whatever additional modules you use to, to process the sentences. And um, I also think it's make, it makes it really hard to make progress towards what I would like to call a universal parser, a parser that can uh, handle Finnish as well as it can handle English, which is something that uh, I'm personally interested in. So this is why I've spent a considerable amount of my time recently to, uh, on this project called Universal Dependencies, uh, where the basic idea is to try to provide a cross-linguistically consistent standard for grammatical annotation. 
Uh, and the, the annotation consists of three components. It's illustrated here with an example from French, toutefois les filles adorent les desserts, anyway the girls love the desserts, or something like that. Uh, and the three components are, first of all, part of speech tags, uh, which are based, which uh, use a revised and extended version of the so-called Google universal part of speech tags. Secondly, on top of the part of speech tags, morphological or morphosyntactic features capturing things like number, person, tense, and so on, uh, which are based on a version of the Interset system developed uh, at Charles University in Prague. And finally, for the syntax, uh, a dependency structure using, again, uh, a revised uh, and modified version of the Stanford dependencies that I mentioned earlier. So let me tell you a little bit about the history of this project, which is kind of interesting. So uh, in the beginning, uh, there were Stanford dependencies, at least at the beginning of this project, right? So Stanford dependencies um, was constructed basically as a back end to the Stanford parser. The Stanford parser was a, a, a probabilistic context-free grammar parser for English that produced phrase structure trees. The people at Stanford found that many people preferred having uh, the output of the parser as a dependency tree. So they built this converter that took the phrase structure trees and converted it to a dependency tree. Now, this parser became very popular, uh, especially for using English. And eventually, not only for parsing, but people then thought that this was a very convenient representation, so people started building tree banks using this representation by but adapting it to different languages. So there was a Finnish tree bank, there was a Persian tree bank, there were a few others. Now, um, a, a few years back, uh, when I was um, a visiting scientist at Google, uh, together with Ryan McDonald, we started talking about, this is very nice that people are using Stanford dependencies, but they're all, again, a little bit different for different languages. Couldn't we come up with a single standard? So we made a first proposal of this, which was, later nicknamed Google Universal Dependencies. Now, the people at Stanford, they thought, yeah, this is a really great idea, but we don't like some of the choices you make, so we make our own version. So that became Stanford uh, Universal Dependencies. Now, meanwhile, or actually a little bit earlier in Prague at Charles University, there was the Hamlet project where Daniel Zeman and others were converting a lot of tree banks to a common representation format, but this time based on the Prague dependency tree bank scheme. Now, the Hamlet tree banks used the Interset system for morphology and tagging. Uh, the other systems use the Google Universal Part of Speech tags. So you see what's happening here. Suddenly there is a lot of interest in cross-linguistically consistent annotation. The only problem is that they're not consistent among each other, right? So uh, at this point we decided to, we need to do something about this. So we tried to get most of the people that were involved in these projects together to sit down around a table uh, and not be allowed to leave the room until uh, they had agreed on a standard. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, electing the Pope, the com white cloud comes out of the chimney or something. And the idea is that all of these should now be replaced by a single framework that we then refer to as universal dependencies. And this is important to stress because there, there is still some confusion in the community about how the, all these things relate to each other. And the idea is that as far as, at least as far as the ones I've talked about here, they are all obsolete now, except uh, and, and replaced by universal dependencies. Hamlet still exists as a project, but it's, it uses universal dependencies as, as its primary format. So a very quick history of this project uh, is that we had what in retrospect might be called a kickoff meeting uh, in conjunction with the European ACL conference in Gothenburg uh, almost exactly two years ago. Uh, we then worked very hard over the summer to release a first version of the guidelines uh, in October of uh, the same year. And we've since had um, three releases of tree banks uh, with these guidelines where the number of languages have, we're very pleased to see, have grown from 10 through 18 to 33. And we're now in the process of having a new release next month, uh, which is, well, I don't know exactly what the number of languages will be, but probably over 40, I think. Now, the Im important thing to point out here is, is that this is a project completely without funding. This is a project where everyone who contributes do so because they think it's worth doing. 
and where everyone is welcome to contribute. So this is, we, we think of this as an open community effort. Uh, this is something that we all need, so uh, we can all contribute and we can all use it. So my secret hope, of course, is that after this talk, some of you in the audience will also think that this is something worth doing and, and, and you will be willing to contribute. All right, so what are we trying to do here? What are the goals and, and, and requirements? So the basic idea, as I already said several times, is to provide cross-linguistically consistent grammatical annotation, which is a less pretentious way of putting it than saying universal grammar, right? It's, it, it's in order to, so that we can make sensible comparisons between languages instead of these misleading comparisons that we've often made in the past. We do this primarily to support multilingual research and development in NLP. So it geared, it's geared towards, it has a fairly practical orientation towards enabling NLP application and NLP research. Of course, we, we are very pleased if it can also be used for other things, for example, uh, sort of linguistic, typological linguistic studies. And we've already seen some examples of that, which is very uh, reassuring. Uh, and we want it to be based on common usage and existing de facto standard. I think experience tells us that if, we if you try to propose something completely new that no one, that doesn't look like anything people have seen before, it's very unlikely that it will be used. So that's why we've, uh, as far as possible, chosen to base this on things that were already existing in the community. Um, a few basic design principles. So first of all is dependency, right? So syntactic representations come in many shapes and forms. Dependency-based representations have become more and more popular in NLP uh, in recent years. They're widely used in practical NLP systems. Uh, and they are available in tree banks for many languages. I think it's probably the case by now that if you look at all the tree banks that are available in the world, the majority would now be dependency tree banks rather than based on other representations. So that makes it a convenient choice. Um, it's based on a, on a version of lexicalism where the idea is that the basic grammatical units, and in this case the basic annotation units, are words. So uh, the basic units we annotate are words. Words have morphological properties, and we annotate th those using part of speech tags and morphological features. And words enter into syntactic relations, right? But there is no attempt, for example, to uh, segment words into morphemes and things like that. Uh, but it's important to stress that, <coughs> like it says here, the notion of word here is syntactic word or grammatical wor word, not phonological word or orthographical word. So we, we don't uh, sort of in general assume that we can trust white space on such things. And so, for example, clitics, which are examples of, of syntactic words that can't stand on their own but have to be attached to other things. I think that we definitely want to treat as separate entities in the... And, and there are probably also some cases where even other types of morphemes needs to be segmented. But this is something that we're still exploring, I would say. Uh, Final uh, design principle is something that we call recoverability, uh, which is about the mapping from the raw input text that you can, can expect to get to an NLP system and whatever word segmentation we decide is appropriate for that language for purposes of annotation. And we want that to be transparent and explicit in the tree bank because I think this is a, a, a problem that has been um, under uh, estimated in the past in many because uh, in, in a lot of parsing research, uh, people use tree banks. They use tree banks to train their parsers, they use tree banks to evaluate their parsers. But all of that tree bank data has already been segmented very carefully into words. So, uh, in, and in some tree banks, you've done very sophisticated segmentation, uh, segmentation so sophisticated that no automatic tokenizer could ever reproduce it. So if you then, you get beautiful results as long as you only use your tree bank data, but when you then try to build a real system that takes real raw text as input, you get a segmentation that is uh, quite different from the ideal one that you saw in the tree bank. Um, so we, we want to give people at least the opportunity to be aware of the possible discrepancy and to develop models for it. 
I will say a little bit about that towards the end, but it will not be um, in focus in the talk. So how do we actually achieve these goals? Um, because, I mean, there are obviously many ways to do it. So we tried to come up with some golden rules that would uh, hopefully prevent us from go going too far astray. Um, and the, uh, the first rule is try to maximize parallelism. And this means parallelism across languages. Uh, and this can be broken down into two basic slogans. The first one is don't annotate the same thing in different ways. And I hope you now remember the Swedish-Danish-English example. That was a perfect example of what you shouldn't do. That was there we had exactly the same syntactic structure in three languages, but it was made to look completely different uh, because of the different annotation schemes. Second half is don't make different things look the same. And this might be uh, even look even more obvious, but if you look around the world in different tree banks, you will often find the same label or category named name used in two different tree banks to mean two different things. I mean, this is usually accidentally and not by design, but we want to be able to uh, avoid that. But on the other hand, we don't want to go overboard. And we don't want to make languages look more similar than they actually are, of course. So in particular, we don't want to start annotate things that are not there just because they happen to be there in some other language. Prodrop is a good example of this. Just because English has this constraint that every uh, clause has to have an overt subject doesn't mean that every other language also has uh, a subject in that position. So the idea is that languages sort of select from a universal pool of categories. And we do allow language-specific extensions uh, when these are motivated to, to capture relevant properties. So um, to... So what does the actual annotation look like? Well, starting with the morphological layer, and I'm again using this uh, um, French uh, example here. So first of all, every word uh, has, um, is assigned a lemma, which sort of represents the semantic content or the base form of the word, whatever you uh, prefer. Uh, it's then assigned a part of speech tag that represents the lexical category associated with the word. Uh, and then it can be assigned a set of features that represent lexical and grammatical properties associated either with the lemma or with the word form. So gender feminine here, for example, is a property of the lemma, fi in French, meaning girl, whereas uh, plural third person um, present tense is a property of this particular verb form, but not of the lemma as such. So the part of speech tags, um, as I already mentioned, is a revised and extended version of the Google Universal Tag Set that was actually first constructed for research on unsupervised part of speech tagging, where there was a need to, to sort of map categories between languages. Uh, and the idea is that all languages use the same inventory. You're not allowed to invent tags of your own, but not all tags have to be used by all languages. So. Uh, if you look at what we have here, uh, most of the things I hope are quite expected. So for open class words, there are adjectives, adverb, adverbs, sorry, uh, interjections, nouns, proper nouns, and verbs. I guess the most controversial part here is the distinction between nouns and proper nouns, and we had a lot of debate over that, um, and uh, the people who wanted that distinction won. Uh, but um, I think I think it's. I mean, my own position is that I think for some languages there is actually uh, some quite hard grammatical evidence that there is such a distinction. Swedish happens to be one. All Swedish nouns inflect for definiteness, except proper nouns and so on. Uh, for other languages, it m might make less sense to make this distinction, and then you don't have to make it. For closed class words, there are adpositions, which sort of abstract over prepositions and postpositions. Uh, there are auxiliary verbs, another possibly controversial categories. Again, I think there are in some languages there are very clear criteria for separating auxiliary verbs from main verbs. In others, there may not be. And there are probably languages in the world that don't have auxiliary verbs. Um, conjunction meaning coordinating conjunction, because there's also subordinating conjunction. Determiner, 
another controversial case. I didn't want to have determiner here, but I lost this debate. Um, numerals, pronouns, and then we have this other slightly problematic category, particle, which is basically any function word that doesn't fit into any of the other categories. We tried very hard to eliminate that, but every time we think we've succeeded, someone comes up with a word in some language that doesn't fit into any of the other, other categories. So we'll see. Uh, and then there are some special categories for punctuation, symbols, emoticons, and similar stuff. And then if you're really desperate and have absolutely no idea what something is, you can put X for unknown. Um, and, and of course, you should use that as little as possible. When we come to the features, of course, it's, it's a lot more open and a lot more varied across languages. Uh, so the idea is that uh, there, we want to have a standardized inventory of morphological features, and it's based on this interset system that was primarily developed by Daniel Zeman. Um, and the idea is that, of course, languages select relevant features because there's probably no language that has all of these features. Uh, and you can definitely here add language-specific features or language-specific values of features, uh, provided uh, that you document what you do. And of course, the idea is that this is something that will have to be revised and extended as more languages keep added. And after what what turns what starts out at maybe a language-specific feature that is only found in one language will then turn up in other languages, and 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 it can be adopted into the. So the idea is that to the extent that we can establish that two languages have the same feature, it should be encoded the same. So this is just a list of the features that uh, happen to be there in the first release. So this is by no means uh, an attempt at an exhaustive list of morphological features. Syntax. Um, I said syntax is dependency-based, but dependency-based syntax comes also in many different flavors. And in particular, one um, thing that is often discussed is how you treat content words and function words, which should be syntactic heads, which should be syntactic dependence. Uh, and the position taken in universal dependencies, which is, I know, not popular in all circles of theoretical dependency grammar, is that um, dependency relations hold primarily between content words. So the idea is that content words are related by dependency relations. So if we have a sentence like the English, the cat could have chased all the dogs down the street, uh, the sort of main syntactic units here are the content words. Uh, first of all, the verb chased, of course, which is the main predicate, cat, which is the subject, dogs, which are the direct objects, and street, which is another nominal modifier. Now, function words are then attached to the content word that they modify. So the idea is that the determiner, the, goes with cat, the auxiliary verbs could and have go with chaste, uh, the determiners all and though go with dogs, and even the preposition down uh, goes with this. So this, especially this part, is sort of contrary to what you would find in many syntactic theories where you expect to see prepositions as heads of prepositional phrases, for example. If you want to include punctuation, you attach it to the head of or the head of the phrase or clause to which you think it's belong. Of course, punctuation. Not everyone thinks that punctuation should be part of the syntactic structure. Now, the reason we set it up in this way, to give the to give primacy to relations between content words, is precisely to maximize parallelism across languages, because we think that by and large, uh, relations between content words are more likely to be similar across languages. Uh, so I want to illustrate this here with a simple example involving English, the dog was chased by the cat, uh, and Swedish. So this is a Swedish translation, hunden jagades av katten, right? So um, these are, as I said, two closely related languages, but they happen to dif differ in some interesting respects here. So the the, th the point is that if we give primacy to relations between content words, then we end up with exactly the same main relations here. So we have the uh, main predicate chaste, uh, we have a passive subject, and we have uh, a nominal modifier. You might want to call it an agent. That's the sort of traditional term in, in passive constructions. And the difference is only that definiteness is in English uh, signaled by a separate function word, the definite article, whereas in Swedish it's expressed morphologically by this suffix here. 
So what is a separate function dependency in English is a morphological feature in Swedish. Similarly, for the passive construction, in English it's a periphrastic construction involving an auxiliary verb, but in Sweden it's a morphological inflection, right? Uh, when it comes to the preposition that is used to signal this agent relation, both um, English and Swedish uh, use a preposition, but of course it's not hard to find languages where this instead would be single, signaled by a particular case ending, for example. So the, the basic idea is that if we give primacy to relations between content words, we are more likely to find parallel structures across languages. So how do we analyze these dependency relations? Well, again, we try to use a fixed taxonomy of, in this case, 40 grammatical relations which are um, meant to be sort of broadly attested across languages in language typology, but we do allow language-specific subtypes to be added. And the taxonomy is organized according to two main principles. First is that we recognize three main types of structures in, across languages. There are nominals, which are used to refer to entities, among other things, but they have other uses as well. We have clauses, which are built around a main predicate, which can be, and often is, a verb, but doesn't have to be a verb. And then there are various kinds of what we call minor modifier words, like adjectives and adverbs, that can take dependence of their own, but don't build the sort of complex syntactic structures that nominals and clauses do. So that's one uh, um, uh, organizing principle. The other one is a distinction between core arguments, essentially meaning subjects and objects, and all other dependents, but not trying to make uh, the very thorny distinction between complements and adjuncts, which in particular in tree bank annotation has been found to be extremely hard uh, to make. So. If we look then at the kind of dependence that we find in clauses, we basically get these two by three tables. So where we have core dependence and non-core dependence, where we have dependence that are nominal, that are clausal, and uh, that are other things. And uh, this particular cell is empty. So um, of core dependence, we have nominal subjects, nominal passive subjects, because it changes the valency, direct object and indirect object. And then we have clausal subjects, active or passive, and we have two types of clausal complements, sorry, uh, where X comp, borrowing terminology from lexical functional grammar, are the, the kind of complements that involve obligatory control. So that is where the subject of that clause is um, uh, identical to some argument in the higher clause. And then we have uh, various types of non-core, so nominal modifiers, vocatives, expletives, and so on. We have adverbial clauses, and then we have a whole range of, of special relations, uh, many of which are for these special functional word relations, like auxiliary verbs, copula verb, and so on. So just to illustrate uh, how these relations are used to annotate clauses, here are a few examples, again, taken from English. So in a sentence like, Mary was quietly reading a book in the garden, uh, that's the main clause, and the main predicate is reading, right? So that's the root of the tree. Now, reading has a subject, which is Mary, a direct object, which is book, and a nominal modifier, uh, a locative modifier, which is garden. Now, and then all of these have function words attached to them that further specify them. Um, if you have a, an adverbial clause, well, a sentence like, if you're sick, you shouldn't exercise, then the main clause is you shouldn't exercise, so the main predicate is exercise, which has a subject, an auxiliary verb, and a negation. And then if you're sick is an adverbial clause. But because this is a nominal clause with a copula construction, we actually take the main predicate to be sick here, not the copula verb, because as should be obvious to this audience, uh, the copula can in many languages be omitted, right? So you can have nominal clauses that just consist of a predicate and uh, a subject. And then we get the parallel structures for those. Uh, and the uh, subordinating conjunction in this case is attached to the verb uh, as a so-called marker. Finally, to, uh, to uh, illustrate clausal complements, Peter thought that he should stop smoking, 
uh, of course, the main predicate is thought, and then ha that has a causal complement without control, which has its own subject, that he should stop smoking. But inside that complement, you have stop smoking, where smoking is um, a, a very simple form of, of sort of control structure where the subject of smoking has to be identical to the subject of stopping, right? You cannot say stop smoking and mean that you stop someone else from smoking. Right, uh, then we come to um, nominals, which are still fairly complex, but less complex than clauses. So we have, we, there are no core and non-core dependents here, so we just have a three-way distinction between nominal, clauses and other. So if we have an example like Moscow, the lovely capital of Russia, then Moscow is the head, the rest is an apposition, and inside the apposition you have, we have, oh sorry, that's a mistake, that should be, Punctuation, of course, yeah. Um, but then you have a determiner, an adjectival modifier, and a post modifier, which is a nominal modifier with uh, a preposition that is annotated as a case marker. Of course, in many uh, languages, that would be something like genitive case instead. Coordination is a very hotly debated construction in dependency grammar. What is the head of a coordinate structure? My own view is that it's not a dependency construction at all, but temporarily we have to uh, give it a dependency analysis. And given the basic principle in, in UD of, giving, of primarily having relations between content words, uh, it sort of follows that if you have Huey, Dewey, and Louie, then you connect the content words by these conjurelation, and then you attach any intervening coordinating conjunctions or punctuation to the head of that. Um, Multi-word expressions uh, are uh, a pain in the neck, as we learned from a, a classic paper by Ivan Sog and others, uh, but, uh, and they, they need special treatment in syntactic annotations. And I should probably say that universal dependencies is probably still a little underdeveloped when it comes to coping with multi-word expressions, but there are some things you can do. So there is an MWE relation, which of course stands for multi-word expression, uh, but which is really only restricted to the very simple, completely fixed phrases, things like in spite of, as well as ad hoc, and so in English. Things that are completely frozen, where there can be no intervening modifiers, and so on. So instead of just treating th those as a single token, we combine them into a, uh, a little tree with the MWE relation, which just it's just a way of saying I'm really a single token. Uh, for names that don't have um, a clear syntactic structure, which are, for example, just the juxtaposition of a first name and a last name, we also think it's very hard to come up with sort of linguistic evidence that one or the other is a syntactic head, so we just want to treat it as a, as a, as a complex string, and we have the name relation for that. Similarly for compounds, which in some languages, like English, for example, are written with spaces, but are really sort of single words. Uh, and there's also this special goes with relation for if you have accidental things that are accidentally written as separate words, even though they are um, uh, right. And there is a number of other relations. So parataxis for very loosely linked clauses. Uh, if you start parsing data from the web, you will very often encounter list structures where it's not obvious uh, that that's really a syntactic relations. Um, Remnant is a special relations for s cases of ellipsis. It's probably going to go away in version two of the guidelines, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Uh, there is a referendum for disfluences if you treat tr transcribed speech uh, and, and uh, a few other things. So uh, I mentioned uh, the possibility of language-specific relation because obviously this is a, a fairly coarse-grained taxonomy and it has to be coarse-grained in order to work across languages. But that means that we lose information uh, when we represent languages in this way. So the scheme allows you to have language-specific subtypes to capture phenomena that is especially important in one language. But we insist that they should be subtypes, right? So rather than introducing completely new relations, whenever you want a more specific relation, you have to say which more general universal relation it's a subtype of. Because that means that if we want, when we want to make cross-linguistic comparisons with the same categories, we can always back off to the universal relations. 
So here is just a list of, again, uh, nothing special. These were just uh, language-specific relations that happened to be popular in the first release of languages. So one of them is relative clause. The basic scheme, I didn't go through that in detail, it doesn't have a, a relative clause relation. It just has a relation for ad nominal clause or uh, adjectival clause. That is a clause modifying a nominal, right? But of course, in many languages, a very s important subtype of that is the relative clause, which has different properties from other ad 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 nominal clauses. So then you can introduce uh, a, a, a subtype of the ACL a nominal clause, which is relative clause. Verb particles in Germanic languages like Swedish and German have a very special behavior. Uh, we think they can be treated, at least in Germanic languages, as a case of compounding. They sometimes actually occur as compounds and sometimes as free relations. But with uh, uh, they're clearly very different from, let's say, noun-noun compounds. So we have a special subtype to separate them, and so on. Now. Um, Finally, uh, this issue of word segmentation and the recoverability principles. So I said that the, we, we assume that the basic annotation units are something like words, uh, syntactic or grammatical words, uh, but how do we actually segment sentences into words? Now this is something that is clearly very much dependent on language. So languages are different sort of typologically with respect to uh, such um, uh, properties as degree of fusion and so on. And it's also dependent, at least as long as we're working with written languages, on the writing system, right? I mean, writing systems with that use white space, for example, obviously give more clues to word segmentation than, let's say, Chinese, right? And it's often non-trivial, uh, even very difficult for some languages. Uh, but the, the, the thing that we think is important, or I at least think is important, is that whatever segmentation we think is appropriate for a language must be reproducible on new data. Because, uh, I mean, and this is the practical NLP perspective coming in again. I mean, if we want to develop parsers and taggers and morphological analyzers using these resources, they will not be worth very much if they presuppose a segmentation that we cannot reproduce on new data. And we don't solve this problem. We don't tell people how they're going to do this, but we provide two options for how to cope with this. So either you can do what people have all, um, traditionally done, that is you only include the result of the segmentation in the tree back. So you put in whatever you think the word units should be for your language, but then you must document how this was done. And that can, the documentation can be different, but very often it's just a reference to a standard tokenizer, saying this data was tokenized with system X. So if you use system X, you can expect to have compatible segmentation. Or in cases, and this is particular for cases where this is, is, is highly non-trivial, you can include a mapping from a low-level tokenization to words in the tree bank. So you put the words in the tree bank, but you also put in what the uh, sort of what the raw input was and how it relates to it. So and, and that way you're saying, sorry, I can't give you a tokenizer for this data because it's too difficult, but I can at least provide you with the input and the output to that tokenizer so that you can try to develop a model that, that does this, or at least you have a chance of knowing what the complexity is. So here's a very, very, very simple example from Spanish uh, of, of how this might go. So if we have a, a sentence in Spanish like, vámonos al mar, let's go to the sea. If you just do a white space segmentation, you end up with four tokens, if you count the punctuation. But the first one here, vámonos, is actually a verb plus a pronoun, a clitic pronoun. And Al is actually the contraction of a preposition and an article. And in order to give a decent uh, syntactic analysis of this, we actually need to split this, right? Because f first, uh, uh, or we think we, you need to, because this is a determiner, this is a, a, an ad position, and so on, right? But so then we, uh, one way of dealing with this is to actually put in the tree bank both of these sequences uh, and, and with a clear mapping so that as a developer, you know how to deal with it. So in order to represent this, um, we th the actual format that we use for um, these tree banks is, again, a revised version. 
that's the theme of this um, presentation, of the Connell X format. The Connell X format has for a long time been the de facto standard for both dependency parsers and dependency tree banks. It comes from the uh, Connell shared tasks on, on multilingual dependency parsing, and it's widely used. So again, in order to get people to use this, we try to stay as close as possible to uh, this existing standard. But we've revised it a bit in particular to allow for this two-level segmentation. So uh, the first, so this is uh, the Connell X format, for those of you who are not familiar, is a text-based format where you basically represent every word on one line with tab-separated columns, and then you have a blank line uh, to mark sentence boundaries. Uh, and the first column is just an ID for the, uh, for the words, a uh, running ID, but, and the second one is the actual word form. I hope this is, is this visible from the back? It's a little faint. Right, so the, so the idea, the new idea here is that you have, may have two types of indices. You have the ordinary integers, which are for the words, that is the linguistically relevant units that we put annotation on. But in cases where those units have been actually extracted from uh, some other surface form, then we put in that surface form as well, and then we put a range to say that the first and the second word were actually occurred together as a single token in the input, and similarly for the others. Then we have the lemma. We have the universal part of speech tag. We have, we allow the possibility of having a language-specific part of speech tag, because many tree banks have uh, their own part of speech tag scheme that they want to retain. Uh, we have the morphological features in the format, um, the sort of basically using this vertical bar as a list separator. So it's a list or set of um, morphological features in this um, format that you've seen before. We then have the head, which is sort of the encoding of a dependency tree by saying that this element is the root. It doesn't have a, any dependence. This is dependent on the first ver word. This is dependent on the fifth word, and so on. And then we have the dependency relation, which is one of these uh, universal syntactic relations. Uh, we do provide uh, an option for having additional dependencies. So another thing that people debate in dependency syntax is whether the representation should be a tree or whether you should allow a word to be dependent on multiple word to cover, so let's say, for example, deep syntactic relations. We do provide an option for that and we hope eventually to provide, oops, sorry. And we do hope to provide guidelines for that, but this is still something that is that needs development. I think there is currently only one of the UD tree banks that actually use this. Uh, and then we have this miscellaneous column. So anything that you think should go in here but doesn't fit into one of the other columns, you can put here. And there's a specified format for it. Right. So where are we now? Well, I already told you that the guidelines were released in October 2014. The latest tree bank release uh, was in November last year, and it um, contained 37 tree banks, but because some tree banks were for multiple languages, the number of languages is only 33. Uh, the record is actually Latin here, which has three different tree banks, uh, somewhat unexpected, uh, and a few others have two tree, tree banks. It's a sample that is still skewed towards Indo-European languages, in particular um, Germanic, Romance, and Slavic languages, I would say. Um, and But we do have some more interesting from a typological perspective. We have Basque, we have uh, Irish, which is Indo-European, but from a uh, less um, common branch, and so on. And we have quite a few classical languages like Old Church Slavonic, Gothic, these are usually um, uh, the New Testament uh, translation in these, of these languages. Um, our future plans is to continue uh, having releases every six months. We've found that a good way to sort of uh, keep um, um, 
developing the project is to keep pushing out data as uh, uh, fairly regularly. And of course, people have to be aware that data may not be perfect the first time it's released. We try to improve it with every new release and we keep sort of um, consistent release numbering so that everyone should be clear about which version of the data was used for something. So, and, and the, the schedule we adopted is that 15th of May and 15th of November. So we're right now preparing the next release for 15th of May. Uh, we're not kidding ourselves into believing that we got everything right the first time. So there is going to be a version two of the guidelines, at least, maybe also a version three, who knows. Uh, we're all, we're, but we're, on the other hand, we're also aware that changing the guidelines too often is a bad idea. That's a sure way to kill a project like this. If you change the guidelines and people have invested a lot of effort in using the previous guidelines, they are not going to be happy, and rightly so, right? So uh, we have to be, we're talking about possibly putting together version two now. It could happen maybe in November, it could happen maybe next year. Uh, we'll see whenever we're ready for that. Uh, and uh, if, oh, sorry, this is the old URL. Uh, so, well, it probably still works, but the new URL is just universaldependencies.org. So um, before I stop, uh, I want to sort of um, come back to this slightly more philosophical perspective that I started out with and take a step back and uh, uh, ask, so what exactly is universal dependencies? What are we trying to do here? So is it possibly a new linguistic theory? No, definitely not. Um, it's very much geared towards practical work in NLP. We don't sort of make any claims about sort of this being um, uh, theoretically valid in all respects. But we like to think that it should be informed by linguistic theory. We should do things that make linguistic sense, right? And that should be potentially useful also for linguistic studies. And we're very happy to see, and I mentioned this before, that we've already seen some really nice example of people using this for linguistic research. So in particular, I wanna mention um, the PhD thesis by Robert Oestling at Stockholm University, where he, thanks to universal dependencies, could do uh, annotation projection to 1,000 languages. This is again a uh, parallel Bible corpus. Uh, and, and he could do word order studies on those languages. Uh, he could, comp for about 300 of the languages, he could compare his results with the World Atlas of Language Structures. Uh, and he could confirm that at least in some case, at least for one of the variables, um, it, it, it was exactly the same as in walls except for one language. And on closer inspection, that turned out to be an error in walls. So uh, seems very powerful. And of course, the nice side effect is that we now also have word order information about the other 700 languages that are not in walls. Uh, so is it then possibly a better parsing framework? After all, I'm a parsing person. I want to get 90% accurate parsing for Finnish. Is this what is going to do it? No, probably not. Um, since actually parsers uh, seem to prefer uh, different assumptions to the one we're making here. There are several studies that show that having function words high in the structure rather than low in the structure leads to better parsing. So it's likely that um, rather than bringing Finnish up to 90%, we're going to bring English down to 80%, which is another way of, of creating equality, I guess. Uh, but uh, actually, I'm a little more optimistic about this now than when I first put these slides together, because there has been some already some work at looking at parsing with, U with UD representation that turns out it's probably not as bad as we thought, and especially if you want to do cross-lingual learning. Um, so there was a paper by Rudolf Rosa from, from Prague at the Dependency Linguistics Conference last year that showed that if you do cross-lingual learning, the, the kind of idea where you train on one language and parse another language, then having the prepositions or postpositions, depending on what it is, low in the structure is actually much better than having them high in the structure, which kind of makes sense because when you do it across languages, some languages have prepositions, some have postpositions, and some have nothing at all, right? Um, 
So is it then possibly the ultimate annotation scheme, the annotation scheme that is going to replace all other annotation schemes? No, I don't think so either. Uh, because as I've tried to explain, in order to be comparable across languages, it has to be fairly coarse grained. We have to abstract, we have to simplify it. So uh, it's clearly not possible to capture everything that you might want to catch in a tree bank using the UD representation. So I personally tend to think of it more as a lingua franca for tree bank developers and parsing people. It's a, it's a format that we can use to exchange and compare data across languages. Uh, it's probably, it probably is going to be useful for some annotation projects. I think it should be fairly quick, for example, if you want to do a first quick uh, annotation of, of uh, some data, and uh, we're happy to see that it's already been adopted for some annotation projects. In particular, we have now uh, 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 a tree bank coming out in the next release on uh, a corpus of English as a second language, which was sort of annotated from scratch using universal dependencies. So is it then possibly a universal grammar? Well, definitely not in the Chomskyan sense, but hopefully in uh, the more practical sense of uh, facilitating multilingual NLP by bringing a little order into the chaos. Thank you. <laughs> and then I just want to acknowledge uh, the entire group. These are everyone who is contributing up to version 1.2. Um, in uh, just a few weeks, there will be an even longer list. So thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, the button doesn't. Uh, Russ. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Anatoly Staristin, a big company. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the talk. Um, I have two short questions. Uh, one question is about projectivity. Uh, do you have a projectivity constraint in your recommendations or not? Uh, uh, you have not talked about it. Okay. Uh, so, the, so the answer is no. We don't have a projectivity constraint. Uh, and in fact, many of the tree banks, possibly all of them, do involve some non-projective structures. Thank you very much. And the second question uh, is a little bit more complex. It's about uh, elliptical constructions. Uh, the strange thing for me about all tree banks, almost all tree banks, is that uh, elliptical uh, sentences are mm, completely ignored in, uh, in most of works about uh, syntax. Uh, so if you are doing something universal, big, that will be used, uh, hopefully will be used by all researchers, you should say something about ellipses. I, I think so. Yeah. No, th thanks for that question. It's a very good point. And we do say something about ellipses in the current guidelines, but we're not entirely happy with it. So currently we have two mechanisms for dealing with ellipses. Uh, the first is something that we call um, function word promotion by head elision. So it's a, it's a very long term for a very simple thing. It's the idea that in some simple cases of ellipsis where you emit the head of a structure, uh, but there is a, sort of a function word that would normally be attached to the head is, l is left stranded, then you can let that assume the role of the. So a typical case uh, in English would be VP ellipsis. So, um, I couldn't do it, but she could, right? So in I couldn't do it, then do will be the head of the clause, and could will be attached to an auxiliary verb. But then when we come to but she could, then the do that should have been there is not there. Uh, and, and, and then we, in this particular case, we just, the, the only thing that is left of that part is the auxiliary could, which should have been attached to it. And then we promote could to be the head of that structure so that she is attached as a subject. So you don't allow addition elements? 
So no, so so that was the simple kind. Then we have the difficult kinds, like gapping, for example. I like coffee and you tea, right? Where we have you and tea, which should be depend on the missing uh, like there, right? And there, the current guidelines have a very complicated solution where, um, so what did I say? I like coffee and you tea. So you is actually attached to I, saying that I perform the same role in the second clause as you do in the first clause. And uh, tea is attached to coffee in the similar way. Now, we've, we've, I think we all agree now that that was not a good solution. And we're currently discussing, we have a special working group. And of course, one um, solution is to put in a verb in the second clause. That is like an empty category. And I personally think that's uh, probably the, the, the simplest and most elegant solution from a theoretical point of view. Now, especially people working on parsing just hate empty categories. So, so this, is, uh, this is a debate that is going on in the community. So if you want to speak in favor of one analysis here, just join us on GitHub and, and join the discussion. It was your turn first, yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, there is uh, another way to annotate, uh, more or less universally annotate uh, phrases in different languages. It is uh, by using so-called deep cases and deep case relations. Yeah. So, have you uh, do you have any consideration or any hooks how how one could relate uh, the deep case structure, which is, which can also be represented as dependency structure and uh, the universal dependency structure you are describing. Mm -hmm. So, are there any ways uh, how to do you try? Well, do you have any consideration how to merge them, mm. how to relay them consistently? So, first of all, I thanks for that question. I mean, it's um, it's another di uh, discussion that was going on at some point. Should we use grammatical functions, uh, things like subject and object, or should we possibly use something like, well, you want to call them thematic relations or semantic relations, which would possibly be things like agent, patient, and so on. Uh, and um, we, I mean, the decision we took was definitely that this is going to be syntax. So if we have something like, um, uh, w where you can have this, the same semantic role being realized by different grammatical functions. So you have these like, um, um, John opened the door and the door opened, where uh, the door is the theme or patient in both sentences. Uh, we, we made a conscious choice, we're not going to capture that in. So, the, so John is the subject and door is the object in John opened the door, and the door is simply the subject in the door open. Now, there are proposals. Some people would like to, and this is about, um, would like to add additional layers of annotation on top of this, right? And some of that could be something like, um, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Semantic role labeling type of structures that could capture that. And if you had that annotation, then of course you could look at the way that grammatical functions was li linked to, to different uh, semantic roles, uh, either within the same language or across languages. Um, I mean, the, the, the whole thing, of course, is not completely because, uh, I mean, when you're talking about universal or many languages, even subject and object are problematic. You have things like ergativity, for example, where um, the, uh, at least the, but th the idea is to try to, um, and, and we think this is fairly firmly based in language ty typology, but the idea is that the, the relations should not be ma uh, based on semantics, but they should also not be m based on things like case marking, right? So the subject is not the, the noun phrase in nominative in languages where that's relevant. Um, yeah. Does the universal dependency help in some way to relate the two types of uh, dependency structures that might be assigned? the deep case based and the yeah. pure syntactic yeah. one. Yeah. I, d I mean, ideally, I think that it, it's a sort of, it's, it's a representational level that will be useful for relating such things and also for studying things like how, um, um, how things like case marking map to grammatical functions and possibly also things like uh, ergativity. Um, it's, it's an open question. Some people would say, 
we really don't need this level. We need maybe some more surfacey syntax, and then we need semantics, right? So, so that's definitely, um, I mean, theoretically speaking. But again, we can we always fall back and say, well, it seems that in in NLP, this kind of representation has been very useful. So, um, we'll continue to use it. I think we had a question up there. Yeah. Having such a uh, universal framework, it uh, sounds really intriguing. And uh, not just from the linguistic research point of view, it's also good from a technical point of view. You have such universal format. You don't need to convert things from one format to another. And I think many people like to use uh, such framework for researching um, parsers, computational parsers, algorithms, and models. And uh, me too, of course. And you have already so many languages, so many um, data already uh, in such format. So it's, it will be really useful. But um, today, most of the research which is published on top conferences like ACL, Conlel, and uh, NACL, they use uh, commonly Pantry Bank and uh, Chinese Tree Bank and others. So. Um, how the people, how the community, the reviewers of these conferences would, will um, uh, review uh, how the how wh what what is the attitude to the work that will be um, made on such corpora on these uh, uh, on these data because uh, there's not obstacle for the pantry bank it you have to purchase it uh, and uh, for many uh, researchers it's a very big chunk of a grant, so you think twice before you purchase Pantry Bank because it costs two thousand dollars, I think. So, um, how do you think? Um, is it possible to make a really good research on these data already uh, with this uh, framework? Mm. I uh, will, will it be um, um, admitted by the? Um, by the reviewers, by other scientists? So th thanks for that question. I mean, I certainly hope the answer is yes. It is possible to do uh, interesting research, and it, yes, it is going to be accepted by reviewers. I think there is also, I mean, there are already papers published uh, on this, uh, and I think, I mean, I think there is one line of research where, let's say, you want to make, um, you want to show that you have the most accurate dependency parser ever for any language, then reviewers are still going to insist, well, you have to run it on section 23 of the Wall Street Journal, so we know that it, whether it's better than all the, all the other ones, right? So if you want to write that particular type of paper, then you probably still need to have the pantry bank. I'm hoping that, I mean, especially in the area of things like cross-lingual learning and, and multilingual evaluation, I think the Connell shared, in dependency parsing, I think the Connell shared tasks um, can have already paved the way for doing things like that. I think it's, I mean, sometimes reviewers complain that you haven't evaluated on the pantry bank, so we don't know whether this is any good or not. But I've also had reviewers complain, well, you should run it on all the different languages on from the Connell shared task, otherwise we don't. And, and, um, and in some cases that can be problematic as well because all of those data sets have not been freely available either, right? But at least it's, it's showing that you can have different standards for different kinds of paper. And um, yeah, I mean, and, and I think the, regardless of what the answer is today, I think the only thing we can do is fight, right? If, if, if there are enough of us who think that this is useful and it's, it's valid and you can publish paper that use this data and not use the pantry bank, I mean, as, uh, uh, if, if there are enough people submitting some papers, such papers, and enough people being reviewers of such paper, then in the long run we'll win. I'm not. I don't think I can give you a better answer than that. Sure. I have a small technical question s on the annotation scheme. Okay. <laughs> so, no, so you want me to a, would no, you want me to no, move to no, a particular no, slide? No. No. Just I, I'm wondering there is a short closed category um, of some specific pronouns which really influence the sentence structure. I mean, question words. Why don't Why don't you mark them? I mean you mean you mean a special category for no maybe spe specific uh, mm, specific link mm. because uh, 
Well, in, well, intuitively, it makes sense because it really changes the structure, and it uh, they are consistent in many languages. In, in many languages, you have special question words, and then something happens with the syntactic structure. So, so by question words, you mean things like what? who who, revu who, who reviewed what? that paper, yeah, for yeah. example? Yeah. Who what? Mm. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I, I guess the uh, I mean, I guess the. Um, Okay, so, so two things. I mean, syntactically speaking, uh, we we follow what I think is is the standard approach in dependencies to say that we just give it whatever grammatical function it sort of substitutes for. So if mm -hmm. you had who reviewed that paper, then who will be a subject, uh, mm -hmm. and if you said who did you send that paper to, then who will be uh, um, together with the with the new uh, with 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 the uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the case marker right there now then of course on the part of speech level i mean most of these will be pronouns or maybe adverbs but then they have features that mark them as, as so you have pronoun type interrogative and things ah. like that ah, uh -huh. so you can definitely yeah. recognize where the function where the mm -hmm. where the question words are mm -hmm. i think another thing that is possibly uh, missing is that um, so, so one very basic um, possibility that it seems that most languages have is the possibility to form questions in the first place, to take this distinct, I mean, you have declarative sentences mm -hmm. and you have interrogative sentences. Yeah. And actually that aspect is currently not marked anyway because yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a property of the clause. I mean, of course, you could put it on the, on the verb, so maybe that's a, a candidate for yeah, an extension. Just perhaps, it, uh, well, speaking in general, um, are, is uh, is there some information, uh, important information, which uh, you miss in, in this notation? For example, some properties, some closed properties, which are not specific to uh, uh, to some. Um, oh, for, for example, interrogative or whatever. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, as I said, first of all, um, because of the of the. I mean, the nature of things, you, you try to come up with a scheme that is coarse-grained enough so that it makes sense to compare across languages. So that is probably always going to mean that we miss some information that you could have about that language. Of course, as, as far as the annotation is concerned, you can always throw it into the miscellaneous field. But actually, I don't think that's what you should do. I think you, what, I mean, if, if, if you, I think you should continue to use whatever favorite scheme you have that you think is appropriate for representing that language. But you should consider um, converting that to universal dependencies so that you can share your data with, with other researchers. And if you, when doing that, find that, look, there is an important thing missing in universal dependencies. So I lose this very crucial information. Or you make a distinction that is impossible to make in my language. So you force me to make a distinction that I don't want to make, right? Then you should tell us about it or um, uh, and, and, and we'll see how it, we can solve it. Because I think the, I mean, the, the whole idea is that this is something that is currently evolving. Uh, with growing age and maybe growing impatience, I've come to the conclusion that I, uh, I sometimes sum this up by saying that the only thing to get something done is to do it. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is that instead of, of, of spending 10 years of trying to design the perfect system, spend six months um, to um, provide a reasonable system, put it out there so that people can tell you what's wrong with it, and then keep improving it. It's never going to be perfect, but hopefully it will get better and better. Uh, I, I, yeah, you already have one question, so we'll have one up there first. Oh, yeah. I think there were actually two uh, people who wanted to. Uh, well, as a god, uh, universal dependencies uh, look at uh, one wo at one token and don't separate it in any way. So why does it happen? Uh, in some languages, we can separate word to some sub words, uh, some suffixes, for example, and set the very same relations. So why don't we make it for for being the grammar more more general? Mm. So yeah, no, that's 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 a good question, and and we've talked a lot about those. I mean, we th we think that 
there are different ways in which you can capture. Sometimes, sort of, for example, inflectional morphemes in one language correspond to, let's say, function words in another language, or maybe a specific word order pattern, or maybe nothing at all, right? So, and, and one way to capture that would definitely be to segment words into many more units, maybe even all the way to morphemes, uh, and then have relations between those morphemes that would look exactly like the relations between words in other languages. Um, we think that's not the right way to do it because we think that uh, making morphology look like syntax is, is, is not the right idea. Uh, and for some languages, it, 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 it works well for agglutinating languages, but it doesn't work very well for fusional languages. I mean, of course, you, you can do some, some sort of more abstract segmentation. So what we, the, the current philosophy is rather, we do segment some things, like I said, clitics and things like that, which are really sort of words that are par parasitic on other words. They definitely have to be segmented. And we're open to also some other morphemes. We're, we're currently working on Turkish, as you may know, is, is an especially challenging language in this, or Turkic languages in general, maybe. And we're still trying to come up with the exact guidelines for Turkish and how to deal with this. and, and uh, but and it's possible that this is going to be revised in some ways so that we will segment a little more. But I'm, I don't think uh, go sort of splitting off everything is is going to uh, be the best solution. But this is this is open to discussion clearly. So I think was no okay so okay so one two okay. Um. What are you going? To I think you need to keep it pressed. Uh, so yeah. what are you going to do with um, languages uh, where there are uh, second position Wackernagel in clitic chains with subjects and objects as uh, well standing in uh, clitic chains? Uh, if you make uh, word order research. Um, in such language, then uh, you need to know it, it, it makes difference if uh, the subject is eclitic or not. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do with the syntactic annotation for such languages? Could you, could you, um, so could, could you give an example of such a language or, so or would, would, would sort of romance clitics be an example of this? Um, so for In example, fact, I work with um, uh, languages of Anatolian family. Mm -hmm. So they've got long, long clitic chains. Yeah. Standing. Slavic languages, yes. So okay. So I mean, I, 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 I the okay. So let let's let's try to put it this way. I mean, the idea is that anything that has a syntactic function should be treated as a separate unit, right? So that if, 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 if it enters into a dependency relation with some other entity, then it needs to be separated. Um, whereas if it only expresses a property of a word, like let's say a morpheme that signals number of a noun, then y it doesn't have to be split off, right? Exactly how this should be done for different languages, of course, is something that needs to be, because I should say, I mean, there is a set of universal guidelines, but there is also language specific, or there should be language specific guidelines for every language that tell you how you interpret the universal guidelines for that language. And that's where all the detailed information about how to do this should be. And of course, I mean, again, the s same point applies again, if we find that we, we have clear evidence that for certain types of languages, the current scheme simply doesn't work, then we clearly need to do something about that. So I, I think I, yeah, I, I'll, I'll come back to you, but we have a, or, or unless you want to claim the turn that you um, declined earlier, but I think we had two questions of, over here. So, so uh, let's do one, two, three, okay. So picking about the conver uh, conversions, uh, do you have, does the dependency frame, uh, universal dependency framework have, uh, has uh, the tools for converting, for example, pantry bank to universal dependency structure, 
or because if uh, there's some trouble with the uh, if reviewers um, need this uh, testament on the venture bank so let's just convert it into new format and yeah. test in that yeah so yeah I, I mean for so let let's put it this way. So so the I mean a lot of the, most of the tree banks that have re been released now are based on conversions, and we try to collect now the converters that people have developed so and to make them available as well, so that you can sort of uh, reproduce this. In the case of English, it's a little more complicated because first of all the English tree bank that is in here is not the pen tree bank; it's the English web tree bank was done by Google. It was originally annotated with the same format as the Pantry Bank. It was then automatically converted, but then it was completely manually re-annotated by the Stanford team. So for the first time, we now have a real dependency tree bank for English that has been manually annotated and not just automatically converted from the Pantry Bank scheme. I do believe that the Stanford converter can be applied to uh, also the original Pantry Bank to convert it into universal dependencies, but it's not going to be as good as the manually corrected one. Right? And similar tools are available for some of the languages too, and we'll try to make more available. I had the same question. Okay. Well, okay, yeah. Uh, as we say that uh, morphology is something that we do not really take into consideration and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, how do we regard uh, polysynthetic languages in that case? Sorry, uh, if, if I said that, I, uh, I definitely gave the wrong impression. Uh, we, we do take morphology very seriously. We just don't think that the right way to treat morphology is to segment words into morphemes. So instead, if, if, if a word contains a number of morphemes, all of those should be um, represented in the morphological features of that word. But instead of splitting a word into sort of many morphemes and putting one feature on, one, on all of them, we're keeping it as one word and putting a set of features on it, which especially for fusional languages and, and, um, is, is much more um, natural, right? So it's so we, in a way we generalize to the worst possible case. Now polysynthetic languages, I agree, might uh, um, th might not work f for that because then that I mean in, in the extreme case we would then have a single word with I don't know how many features. But that brings me to the other point is and that's the again I mean this is just a, a, a general guiding principle and exactly how you apply it to different languages is tricky but the guiding principle is that if something enters into a syntactic relation with something else then it needs to be separated so I assume that in polysynthetic languages I mean or at least in cases of incorporation if that's relevant I mean you do have for example the object incorporated into the verb and if you want to express that uh, syntactic relations then you need to segment it so that would not be the same as inflectional morphology, right? I mean, it, it's when I say we don't want to over-segment, I primarily refer to inflectional morphology. Yes. Uh, you, you mentioned ergativity, so the question is for the ergative languages, what are the guidelines to assign the uh, subject and object? Um, I wish I knew. Um, I think I, 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 I can do it. Well, we have the expert here, so. Subject uh, in the ergative in comparative or the absolute in the comparative and the object is the absolute in comparative. So, so, so basically what it means is that the things that are labeled as subjects won't always carry the same case. But that is true for many other languages too. I mean, you have Icelandic, for example, which has quirky case, which is not ergative, but where the, the, the subject can be nomit nominative, genitive, or dative, right? Now Fran is going to correct me on that. Uh, no. Wait, now the, oh yeah, the uh, So it's come up uh, several times about the splitting words into morphemes and stuff. Um, so uh, Chara Choltekin, has a really nice paper on this in the conference, dependency conference that was in Poland um, about approaches for Turkish. Um, and if you're interested in how 
it is probably going to work in UD, you should go and read that paper. Thanks. I should read it too. <laughs> yes. You, you have to tell me when to stop here because I'm happy to stay uh, until midnight, but maybe some people want to leave, so. Uh -oh. My question is perhaps very simple uh, for you. Uh, so you see, uh, you s <coughs> I'm just wondering, uh, after you try, after your attempt to, to standardize uh, the notations, how much of the problem uh, will, will be solved? Can we do things, for example, like if two languages are very close, then we could train the parser on one language and just apply it to another language. Mm -hmm. I think this is w was your main motivation. Mm -hmm. Secondly, for example, if we have two very distant languages like English and Korean. In Korean, you have uh, verbs at the end of the sentence, mm -hmm. always. Yeah. So how much, what is your intuition? Will it mm -hmm. help or and how much? And, uh, so uh, and maybe one more thing. Uh, uh, you currently, you try to standardize, let's say, notations, maybe morphological uh, dependency, but would it be possible or make sense to also talk to some kind of subtrees, maybe if they co-occur uh, across different languages, that would also be possible you know, to use? Or so, sorry, what, 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 uh, did you say subtrees? For, for, for example, if you, if there is a sentence, maybe it is complicated in one language, mm. but you detect some part of the sentence and then uh, you translate it into another language and you know that for this part of the sentence with this m text, you will always have this type of translation. Mm. But, uh, so you, could, you, you just recognize mm. some subtree. Mm. I mean, I, I, sh I should say that, I mean, even though translation seems like an obvious application, uh, almost none of the data here is actually parallel yet. I mean, we do have tree banks for, for many languages, but there are very few. Uh, there is actually, in the next release, there is going to be a Swedish-English parallel tree bank in universal dependencies, but that's the first. But, but to answer your first question, which is really interesting, I mean, I'm pretty sure, or in fact, people have already done experiments showing that if, yes, if you have closely related languages, uh, having this consistent annotation will definitely allow you to tra either train parsers on one language and parse another language or pool resources, put together all the training data you have for, I mean, the Romance languages seems to be a very good case of this. I mean, so um, Spanish, Portuguese, and even French uh, seem to mix very well with each other. Now, what you can do with more distantly related languages is of course even more interesting because Sp Spanish, Portuguese, and French are not low resource languages, so they do well on their own. But we have a very high number of languages in the world that have, um, 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 very few resources, and most of those are maybe not Indo-European and don't have closely related languages that have rich resources. So, and I think that's, I mean, that is definitely going to be a more long-term research effort, but I think it's, it's, it's very, very interesting to think about ways in which you can build much better parsing models that sort of take this. And actually one of the uh, main advantages of the new scheme that I see from the point of view of parsing is that we will now be able to put more linguistic knowledge into our parsers because especially in statistical dependency parsing um, until recently because we were, have been working on many different languages but all with its own annotation scheme uh, we have had to remain completely agnostic about what dependency labels mean so basically all the statistical dependency parsers only know one linguistic construction that is a head connected to a dependent with some funny label on it and the parser has no idea what the label means now that we have standardized labels we know that the subject relation is a completely different relation from let's say the auxiliary relation or even the punctuation relation right so we can make parsers that are better equipped in the sense that they have expectations about what kind of constructions and relations they can find in different language. Of course, they are realized differently and, and, and it will require quite a bit m of more engineering and abstraction before we can really sort of capture, transfer knowledge from, let's say, um, I don't know, um, Swedish to Quechua or whatever. But I think it's a, it opens up very interesting uh, research opportunities. Yes. 
Thank you. Alexander Ratsyevsky, point five. So uh, when you look at a uh, variety of languages, it seems that sometimes it's difficult to make distinction between parts of speeches and text and yeah. uh, features. So yeah. in the course of work, did the team consider to treat uh, parts of speech as speeches, parts of speech as features? And yeah. if you did, then why? Uh, under which arguments do you reject that? Mm. Thank you. Yes, we. It was definitely one of the things we we talked about, sort of. In, uh, and uh, I think the I think the reason why we didn't go down that road was again this sort of more practical NLP. Um, in 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 the NLP community, people are extremely fond of part of speech tags. We've used them forever, and they're very useful for things like parsing. So we're, we, I, I, I guess we were thinking that people are not just ready for this yet. Of course, I mean, th the thing is that once you have the representation, there's nothing that stops you from converting it to a representation where you do that. Um, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to say as well. What was that? Sorry, I lost that. Yeah, okay, yeah, so the... I mean, the, the thing about UD, and, 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 and you shouldn't forget this, is that it's in, in, in some ways it's a hopeless compromise because we're trying to do many things at once. We're trying to service uh, the NLP community, the application developers that don't even know what a parser is but wants to use the output of one. Uh, and, and hopefully we also want to be useful to linguists. And this is really an impossible task. So you're for constantly forced to make compromises, right? And... Um, yeah, and, and I guess you could sort of say that this is one of those compromises. Yes, please, Edward. Thank you for your talk. Uh, it's, al it's almost May, so which languages are you going to include in the version 1.2, uh, 3? Shall we find out? Is this is this computer connected to the internet? If the answer is on the site, I will consult the site. Okay, so no, actually, all of this is already. Uh, I'm not sure I can. Is there a? Is there like a browser here? Let's see whether this works. Uh, oops. Right. <laughs> um. Anyone can type universal dependencies in Cyrillic. <laughs> uh, maybe I, I shouldn't do this. Okay. So if, if you go to universaldependencies.org, uh, at the, at the um, homepage, you will first, at the top, you see the universal guidelines. And below that, there is a big table with all the languages on which there is ongoing work. And on, on those languages, uh, for every language, it specified the amount of data available, which release it's going to be part of, uh, if it hasn't been released already, what kind of annotation is available, because not all, for example, not all tree banks have lemmas yet, and, and so on. So that should allow you to find out. Uh, if I can remember, I think, uh, I mean, Russian is definitely at least a candidate. There is work on Russian. We'll see whether it will be ready in time. Um, what else do we have? Kazakh. Um, uh, we have, well, Estonian was already in there, but there's a new bigger tree bank for Estonian coming out. Uh, sorry? Ukrainian. Ukrainian, yeah, that's right. There's work on Ukrainian. I don't know the exact state of that. Uh, there's Galician to get a more uh, uncommon language. Um, Turkish. Probably, hopefully, uh, Chinese coming up. Chinese was not in there before, uh, and also Korean, I think. And uh, yeah, I'm probably forgetting some now, but I can't remember. So I think, I mean, I think the current number, uh, the number of languages on which there is, w well, sorry, I should say the number of tree banks on which there is currently work is 54 or something like that. And, and that tr probably translate into, uh, I don't know, 48 or something, or 47 languages. I don't think all of those will be uh, part of the next release, but um, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. 
working with real um, live data, you have some non-linguistic constructions, quotes, you have these uh, lists or enumerators in Word, you may, you know, and should we include them to annotation or we better ignore them and forget about their existence because sometimes uh, you can't just forget about the quote, you can't just forget about this enumerator which is uh, uh, the part of the previous sentence. Mm. Uh, should we make some special markup for them because uh, uh, working with uh, real texts, you happen to find them very often. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I think it's uh, it's quite clear that if you if you just scrape things on the web, you definitely get things that I don't think it makes sense to try to annotate grammatically. Right? Exactly where you draw the line, uh, I think, is is basically a research question, and I think it's something that is being pursued. I mean, increasingly. Uh, more and more of the data sets actually do contain things like data that come from the web and we do provide some simple mechanism. I mean there is the list relation for example which you can use to simply string things together saying that this is a list of email addresses for example and if you want to connect them into a structure you can say that they form a list. I don't know how useful that is really. Um, but and, and maybe we will need to do more on this but basically that's um, up to the to the individual researchers and tree bank providers to try to make an informed choice and to let us know if the annotation scheme stops them from doing things that they would like to do.